Okay, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse Hildebrand, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. So today, I'm excited to say we're joined by four classes from across North America. I'm going to give them each a chance to do a bit of a shout out. We've got Mrs. Huddy's class from Calgary, Alberta. <laughs> Awesome. We've got Mrs. Cochran's class from Beamsville, Ontario. <laughs> We've got Mrs. Lynch's class from Calspell, Montana. There they are. I don't know if we heard you guys, but we can see you're enthusiastic, which is great. And then we have Mr. Sharp's class from New Liskert, Ontario. Yes, great nine and ten enthusiasm. All right. <laughs> uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is not for me. It's for our wonderful speaker, Kate Leeming. Uh, she is a world-class cycle adventurer. She has been all across Africa, Australia, Siberia, and more. Uh, she is doing an expedition currently in the Yukon, and I don't want to steal her thunder, so I'm going to let her tell her story, show you her amazing bike, and share what her expedition is all about. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Kate. Brilliant. Thank you, Jesse. Now, I need that link. Here we are. Let me just, what I'm going to do, as I just explained, if anyone missed it, I'm going to sort of tell you about my story because it's a little bit unusual. I've done a lot of different trips and I'm going to focus quite a bit on Africa because that was my last really big journey when I cycled across Africa. And then I'm going to launch into breaking the cycle South Pole and how I'm planning to uh, cycle across Antarctica. And I need to do all this special preparations and training. So we'll get into that. But the first thing we'll do is I'm going to switch you on to, the, um, to my presentation. So just bear with us. So it's screen share and share. Mm -hmm. And now, um, I just need to get on to my thing. Is this looking good? You're in, yes. Right, so just get that onto here. Good, how's that? Perfect. Perfect, okay. Today's gonna to be a little bit of a mix. So if you can see that, that's, that's great. Um, today's gonna to be a little bit of a mix. Uh, Africa mostly and Australia. So my story started off with me. Um, you know, that I, I took the story about you, Kate. Two seconds. We had a new class join in, so take a look the class. If you guys could just your microphone. Yeah, honestly, that's really bad right now. Sorry, Kate. Give me one second. Um, okay. Yeah. We had a new class join yeah, really in. We're stuck. Right? And it could be because my... Yeah, it could be because my laptop... Internet was being weird. Uh, even oh, see, oh, I don't know what's happening. I can't control their mic right now, guys. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Kate, try now. Right. Okay. So let's just start that again. So, I mean, everyone here, there, sure, I'm surely rides a bike and knows what it's like to ride a bike. Whether you ride bikes for fun or to get to school or or to go on, when you're on holidays or whatever, and that's kind of how I started riding a bike. So I want to explain how did I go from that to now, where the total distance that I've done around the world is like 20, uh, twice around the world at the equator. That's the total distance that I've done. And, and so back to the story. So yeah, a lot of people seem to say, you know, oh, you're mad. You're mad doing all this kind of stuff. And that's how I used to think sometimes too. But now I learn to look at the positives and I think, well, I like to think of MAD as making, standing for making a difference, which is what I try and do with each of my expeditions. Now, my story uh, started off, someone who inspired me very much to travel by bicycle was my great-great-uncle, William Snell. And in 1897, he became the second person to cycle across Australia when he cycled from Western Australia in the goldfields across to Melbourne to propose to his childhood sweetheart. And fortunately, she said yes, and they got married. And he put on the boat to come all the way around to the west of Australia again. And then he cycled all the way back again. Now, I grew up on a, a wheat and sheep farm in Western Australia, so it's a very long way from here. 
And um, I went to school there, normal school life, and went to university. And after that, I did a little hockey, t uh, a hockey tour in the UK. So hockey, hockey meaning field hockey, not ice hockey. And uh, from there, I, I, I did a little trip in Ireland and then bigger trips through Europe. And over the space of the next couple of years, I did about 15,000 kilometers through Europe. And that's really where I discovered my own passion for cycling. And I guess I really love to do these things because, you know, I really love the way that you're very connected with the people and the land. And I love the idea of bringing a light on a map to life. And I think that cycling uh, really brings a great sense of place and really a perspective of how all the world fits together. And then I was planning this journey to cycle across Russia but a long time ago now. And I met this fellow called Robert Swan. And... He's a polar explorer, and he's the f uh, first person to have walked to both the North and South Poles. And Robert really inspired me, and he taught me that there was much more to what I was doing than just making it a simple bike ride. So ever since then, I've tried to really benefit people and places that I've traveled through. And uh, so the next year, I became the first woman to cycle across the whole of Russia from St. Petersburg, which is on the Baltic Sea in Europe, to Vladivostok, which is near Japan. And we were very, very excited at the finish because after five months and after breaking a rib on the step and after getting through this swamp, there's 1,500 kilometres of swamp, which is about almost 1,000 miles, uh, we reached Vladivostok one day ahead of schedule. And that was all about uh, very good planning and sticking to the goals and, and, and really having a good team as well. We worked together very well as a team. I had some Russians with me as well. And um, it was just an amazing time. So I just wanted to, in fact, every single expedition that I've done, my 25,000 kilometre journey through Australia, was also um, finished on time, as did my African journey. So, um, yeah. So now I'd just like to share with you a little bit about how these things happen. They don't just happen. There's a lot of organisation that goes on. And uh, so when I was in Australia, I got this idea about travelling across Africa. And the way that the idea came about was that I was looking about, because I have a real passion about the importance of education. And so I was looking at this and I could see there was a, a whole lot of countries between, <clears throat> between the West Point and the East Point across the Sahel region that had the most need for, for improved education. So then I looked at the whole thing and I realised that actually, no, I looked, had to look at all the causes and effects of extreme poverty. So not just, not only did I travel across Africa and learn about the people and the places, but I also was looking at all the different reasons, whether it's to do with education, whether it's to do with um, health, whether it's to do with hunger and food security, or all sorts of things, or economic development. So that's what I was looking at. So I didn't just get lost. I was, I was looking at all the different issues. That's, that's, that's a 6,000 kilometre diversion around there. So um, yeah, so this, this, uh, this whole journey was just amazing, to, but to get it together, it took me 18 months just to get it together, to find all the sponsors, to organize everything, to find the team, to um, put it all together. So I was really ex exhausted at the start as well, but also very relieved and very excited to get going. And very quickly, I was meeting all sorts of different cultures. And here, this was on the border between Mauritania and Mali, very remote place. There's, there's no real roads there, just a little sandy track. And so you imagine how surprised these people would have been to see me riding a bicycle and, and my friend Daniel at the time riding a bicycle through there. And uh, they're always very intrigued. And this one, these people weren't just dressed up for the picture. They were, this is how they dress normally. These are um, nomadic people that, that live in that Sahal region called the Fulani people. And we were sitting under a tree having lunch and they walked by and they were really curious but a bit scared of the, the boys that I was travelling with. And so I thought, oh, I'll get up and I'll go across. And they didn't seem to be scared of me. So I went across and picked up my camera out of my bag and sort of quietly moved across and took a snapshot of my friends so they could see it couldn't, didn't hurt and showed them the back of the screen of my camera, my digital camera. And then they all wanted their photo taken. And uh, that it was just, just, they were so innocent and so beautiful. And uh, yeah, so it's just a real treat to be able to see these people. And they've probably not seen a camera before like that or maybe not even a... A, a, a white person as well. I'm not sure, but it was it was um it was an amazing time. We also had a chance to try lots of different things. The, this was up in the mountains between in Cameroon, between there and Nigeria, up in the north of Cameroon. And uh, here I was tasting some little wild figs. Uh, so 
it was uh, they were beautiful, just like little dried figs, and uh, it was a lovely way to be able to share different people's cultures. Now, all of this time, I had to be prepared to um, think of the big picture because it'd be nice to be able to sit around and and talk with people all the time. But I also had to move through because I had to balance this journey with the seasons as well. So I had to do about a 130 kilometers every single day that I traveled and I really had to be mindful of the goals I had to think you know I had to get to the end in Somalia on time and then I had to work that back so every every uh, city every every um, month I had to, to get to where I planned to get to even though sometimes the path was a little bit different and there's lots of different obstacles whether I was falling off and hurting myself as I did in, in, in Cameroon um, or whether it was mud, so we had to cross the, the equator twice and we couldn't avoid all of the wet seasons. So sometimes, especially through the Republic of Congo and, and Gabon, we had a lot of mud. And uh, so it's just a matter of just keeping going, keeping going forwards all through all of that. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, did, did you ever want to give up? And the answer was really no, because I really believed in the pro project and I was really believed in this mission and I had about 30 different sponsors. I had a, an education program, I had schools following me, lots of people. So um, I'd never want to let them down as well. And I really wanted to explore and see the world and, and really wanted to get across Africa because it was an incredible place. But um, about a quarter of the way across, I was having a really tough time. I was cycling into the, the Hamilton, which are really tough seasonal trade winds that come in off the Sahara Desert, whipping sand off the desert. I was sick. I'd had three gastro gastros. Uh, I, I had a, a chest infection and I wasn't feeling too good. So I really had to get my mind around all of that and, and just to keep going. And I guess what really helped me was to look forwards to think about Somalia and think how amazing it would be to, 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 to be getting to the finish and cycling across these incredible Somali plains and then work back and think of you know, the next month in advance and then all the things that I was looking forward to. And then I work all the way back to each week, each day, each session, each hour, right back to thinking about, uh, you know, each, you know, just getting to the next bush or next getting to the next pothole or whatever. But what really helps me the most, perhaps, is to really look for the beauty in your surroundings. I mean, this picture looks stark. And, you know, it's in the Sahara Desert, it's amazing. But actually you can see if this is a horrible desert or a beautiful, beautiful place. And that's how you need to see things to get through. And I looked at lot, lots of different um, uh, uh, educational and um, projects as well, as well as other things as well. So um, I guess one of the most important things was looking at the, the importance of education of girls and women. And in Burkina Faso, which is a country in West Africa, I went, I was visiting a community and what I learned there was it's all very well to build schools and things, but you actually need to be able to um, work with the people and really speak to the leaders and, and, and the men need to understand why the girls had to have education, why it was important for the girls to have education and so that everyone had equal rights. And so that was kind of, because in the past, the... Um, the girls often they didn't sort of think that it was so important to educate the girls but actually when when the girls were educated the communities did better and they had um, small, uh, smaller families and they also just tended to do much better in terms of um, uh, that they could earn more money and and the community was always healthier so it was fantastic this this place and also just for for everyone girls and boys you know for the future generations you know to uh, um, to really look after tomorrow's leaders. Now I'm going to skip right across to the other side of Africa, and um, this is Somalia. Okay, this is on the very eastern tip where I had to get through to get to the most easterly tip of Africa. And I'm showing you this map with all the different colours because it was showing you actually the political situation in in Somalia at the time because they have a few problems with some extremists, and obviously I can't just turn up at the border and expect to come in. I had to plan this and be talking with the governments for months and actually before the start of the journey. And so what you can see there is um, the blue bit was which it was the area of Somalia at the time when the, the, the federal government um, that, that they were controlling. The yellow bit was Somaliland. You kind of got to think of this as three different countries, Somaliland, Somali, Southern Somalia and Puntland. 
And Somaliland's much more stable, but still a little bit dangerous in some ways. And then we had to get across Puntland, which is the brown, and that's like a state of Somalia. But the worrying thing was the green, and that's where these, these extremists were. And I'll just show you the route that we had to take, which was following the main road, crossing over a buffer zone between Somaliland and Puntland. Uh, and that was because they don't get on that well, so we had an area that was quite tricky to get through. And then I had to go quite past that, that green area before getting to Cape Harfun. And so I said I was working with the governments. In fact, the president of, of Puntland um, actually loaned us his special forces to, to, to protect us as well. And that last section going across the plains, we virtually did undercover. So the last 370 kilometres was... Uh, um, we, we were travelling with two bulletproof vehicles and the military unit. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite... We even got lost at one point. But no one could really know where we were. And finally, we got to Hafun, which is a little uh, peninsula, a little isthmus on the, on, on, on the end, and there's sort of an island on the end. And we had to go basically through this sandy track along the beach and then up over that mountain I'm getting very excited now two kilometers to go I had a, sort of a huge team behind me i was very 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 excited to get to the finish and uh, that was it the, the most easterly tip of africa next to an old italian lighthouse and uh, my sister was there she was in that in, in the bulletproof vehicle as my cameraman was and uh, so it was a pretty amazing time and you know it was quite you know the idea of this whole expedition, you have sort of the vision, you have the organisation, you have the execution of it. So I finished there four days ahead, ahead of schedule after 10 months. Uh, and then uh, after that, that's not really the end of the project because then I had to sort of document everything and I wrote a book to analyse everything. I had made a film as well. And uh, there was so much to pull together still. So it was another four years afterwards. In fact, the TV series is still being made, believe it or not. Uh, so the only other thing to do is once you've done all of that is to think, okay, what am I doing next? And I already had the ideas and to, to take all those ideas and put them all together and go for a new vision. And that is breaking the cycle South Pole. So the African journey was called breaking the cycle in Africa. And this is breaking the cycle South Pole. And I had this idea about cycling across Antarctica. And coming from Australia, I'm good at the heat, you know, it can be up to like 45 degrees sometimes when I'm traveling, 45 degrees Celsius. And so I had this idea, but so therefore I had to work out whether it was really possible. And no one had ever at the time cycled to the South Pole before, but now, and in the past it would have been just totally impossible. But now it's kind of with improved technology and, and, and connections, it, it's, it's, it became a realistic dream. So, um, so yeah, so I went about working out the technology and I thought what kind of bike would be the best kind of bike to use. And my, my, all my research ended up, I ended up talking with a, a, a fellow in, based in Philadelphia in the US and he made these bikes that were all wheel drive. So you can drive the front wheel as well as the back wheel. And he'd made them only for um, mountain bikes before, just normal mountain bikes. And I had this idea, why can't you put that system into a, a fat bike, which has got big fat tyres so up to five inches wide. And so this was the first bike being made up. And then I'd found a team around me to help learn and, and get an experience. I had um, um, uh, Eric Phillips, who was an Australian polar explorer, a filmmaker, Claudio von Planter, and another cameraman. And... I'm just going to show you this little video, and this just shows you a little bit about how that bike works and a little bit about, it shows, um, you'll see, a little bit about what I did in... The uh, concept was a senior project, and it evolved into a prototype company and then production for mountain bikes and turned into a motorcycle line. And now we are going to branch back into mountain bike world with the introduction of our old drive fat bikes. Our decision to get back into the bicycle business was really initiated by Kate when she contacted us about building a custom fat bike for an expedition to Antarctica. So the first all-wheel drive fat bike we ever built was for her, and it was about two years ago. So the next step is actually to try to help her cross Antarctica on a, on a bicycle. 
So that was that, and so that was just to show you a little bit of, about how the all-wheel drive system works. It's quite ingenious, there's nothing like it, and it's, it's very robust and quite very strong as well. And so anyway, so that, that's a little bit about the bike, and then you'll see this, these pictures. I'm going to keep talking with this as, as this, this uh, goes on. But what you'll see, um, these are some photographs that were taken on that Spitsbergen ride, and I wanted to explain a little bit about what it's like to, to ride on soft surfaces, it's, it's it's almost like um, you know, it's very very tough because you don't you can't always quite tell when the the bike's going to sink down, and so you're always struggling, spending a lot of energy to stay upright. If you can imagine cycling on sand or cycling on snow is 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 quite similar. Although I think for me the extreme cold is much more difficult because I'm not used to it, so I have to, you know. When I was in Spitsbergen, I, the day before I left for Australia, it was like 20, 37 degrees Celsius. And then a week later, I was in Spitsbergen and it was down to mi minus 15 at the start and it got down to minus 30 Celsius. So pretty tough for my little body to, to deal with that. And, uh, but what we learned from this trip, uh, it wasn't a very long journey, but what we learned from this was that cycling across Antarctica was going to be really possible. And uh, so we, we, we trialed a whole lot of different surfaces there, sort of the ice cap. Um, sometimes we were following... Um, skidoo highways like that, snow, snow machine highways, um, and uh, it was also, you know, it might have been tough, but again, you know, it was just such an incredible privilege to be able to travel in a place like that, especially on a bike. It's, it's almost unreal, and uh, I found it very inspiring for myself as well. So that was that was Spitsbergen. That was that was about three years ago, and uh, so then we move on, and so the next. So basically what I had to do then, you know, all these things cost quite a lot of money. So it took me quite a while to um, find the funding to do the next training run, which is in northeast Greenland. So it's the first time anyone had ever done a bike journey in northeast Greenland. Um, so we went there thinking, oh, it'll be a great challenge. And we'd learned a lot from the last time. Steve Christini made a second bike. The first bike was pretty good, but it could only hold a four inch or 10 centimeter wide tire on the back. and really. The most important thing is actually to have maximum tire width. So he, he designed a whole new bike, which was quite a, a tough thing to do. And I collected the bike from the US on the way around and into Greenland. And Claudio von Planter, uh, my filmmaker, and I went to Greenland for three weeks. And uh, you can see here, we've always got to take precautions. So, so here I'm cycling beside a uh, polar bear tracks there that had gone, gone through the day before. It's a mother and cub, actually. Uh, so we always have to be wary of the dangers, and obviously we had to uh, have precautions to 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 make sure that we were safe. Because you know polar bears can be around; they could have been around in Spitsbergen, Greenland, or where I'm about to go in the Yukon as well. And you can just see there how hard I'm working. And, and Claudia, this was this was supported by a snow machine. So Claudia was on a snow machine. You see just how much I'm working to just trying to get up those hills, and it was a pretty tough time. But then after about three or four days, I started to really find my stride and I was starting to do 50, 60 kilometers a day um, down the fjords. And this is where the bike's very good, going over bumps like that. It, the front wheel only drives uh, when the back wheel slips. So if you skid around a bit or find it a bit slippery, the, the front wheel helps pull you out of it. Uh, so it doesn't make you a lot faster, but it keeps me going for a lot longer on the bike. Here's a little video as well of this. So this is just a little bit, just. Only part of the video that Claudio made, but you can just get a real feel for what it's like much more. Um, this is a little bit about Greenland. Right, come on, Phil. What is it? Um, well, do you want to see where we are? Yeah, yeah. Where we are? Yep. The track goes up here up this little valley it's at least 200 meters yeah down the other side along mm. the coast and then coming in which is actually safer because um the further out you go the more dangerous it is you don't feel like just just dropping into the ocean yeah it's all it's usually water caught. here <laughs> so yesterday we actually started right up about here on the land we've gone all the way down harry fjord to somewhere mm. around that's it there. that was about 50 kilometers yeah it was okay. <laughs> yeah. Today looks like nothing compared to yesterday, but 
<laughs> I think there's going to be a struggle. Just setting off on day five now, and just following the sort of the main snowmobile track towards the top of Tormit. It's only about 35 kilometers away, and yesterday I did it 50. This is easy going for now, but soon I'm going to have to go over the land to cut a corner up over quite a big hill. I believe this is going to be quite soft snow, so it might be a bit of a struggle ahead. So 35 k's normally would take me an hour and a half, a bit less. This might take a bit longer. Here they come. They're all waiting for me up the hill. So they reckon I'm probably going to struggle, which is a pretty steep, steep rise. Right, I'm in the bottom gear, so let's see, here we go. Off the sea, onto the land. Right, that's what we can do. This is hard. self-motivation speech in there yeah i don't think i swore too much <laughs> that's all part of the oh yeah that's rich fine. tapestry isn't it this is good i couldn't have done that at the end of the day there would have been no chance of doing that you get conditions like this you'd be flying to antarctica but we know they're not going to stay like this are they? it's good in snow world conditions are like this but as we know they change <laughs> But I'm in energy conservation mode now. Steady, steady, steady. Unfortunately, when I look ahead, there's a big third lung bust for the morning. Reaching the summit. Isn't that amazing that I can see the sea? So we move on. So you made it to the finish, the most beautiful place probably I've ever cycled that, just about, just out to this Cap Tobin. Um, and then we continued on uh, to, yeah, that was the finish. And then back to uh, the airport and out we went again. So to the new vision. So uh, another year's passed and I needed to do one more training run uh, because Greenland was much warmer than it was meant to be. So we lost a lot of time because of melting snow and it was much softer because of that snow. So we only really had eight days out of those three weeks. So Yukon, you can see the size of this place. And at the moment I'm talking to you from Whitehorse and this is gonna be a four week journey. So in, in, um, on Monday, we're gonna be driving up to Dawson City, which is in the middle of the Yukon, which is about 700 kilometers from here. And then, uh, then I'm going to do an acclimatization ride and it's going to be a little bit different to that route now because um, we're actually going all the way, not just to Eagle Plain, but to McPherson, which is at the end point of that uh, journey there at the moment. So we're going to start there, but then we're going to then travel across to Old Crow. And so the, the Dawson Highway is just an all weather track uh, road, uh, which is frozen the whole time from permafrost. Uh, so that'll be you know a, a good introduction and then we'll go off piste basically onto onto the snow um from mcpherson across to old crow then potentially up or well, up to the beaufort sea uh and then hopefully to herschel island if we have time it's all a little bit adaptable because it just depends you know we don't know exactly how much i can do uh, a day because the conditions are going to be quite variable and uh and then we'll finish again potentially we could finish in Mc, uh, McPherson, Fort McPherson, or we could actually go up to Inuvik and then up to uh, a Tuck at the top. There's a nice road up there. So that's the plan. Uh, the idea is for me to have a really extended training run. And also Steve Christini's made me a third bike. So I picked it up. So I arrived here um, 
the day before yesterday uh, and, uh, and the bike was, thank goodness, just finished in time and sent up here. And this was it yesterday. I took this, about, just they all added all this in yesterday. Um, this was it being made up uh, in the shop here. And the reason I needed a new bike is, is because this one now has the fattest tyres possible, so that gives us more flotation. And there's just a few little changes and improvements that needed to be made. And also to go, if I'm going to cycle across Antarctica, it's good to have two bikes in case one breaks down. So that's why I needed the, the other one. This one we're also experimenting a little bit. I'm just going to talk while this is being done. But um, what we're doing here, we're going to try, it's just experimental at the moment, we're going to actually try to use, when it gets really soft, a ski. You know, the big chest. And it was being cut yesterday, this hole in there, and it fits on the bike. So it may or may not work, but we just think that if we can add some flotation when it's really soft, this might really help me be able to move. Might, might make the difference between moving and not moving. So, um, yeah, so we'll see. I'm a little bit skeptical so far, but, but um, it's, it's worth a try. And uh, so, yeah. Not a lot of space, isn't it? Not a lot of space. We, we can't cut any more out of that, that ski yes. or else it'll lose its strength try. too much. Anyway, I'm not sure whether the mechanic was that sure about it either. But right, what do you reckon? Give it a go. And just about there. So that's the bike. I took that shot yesterday. All ready to go, so I'm quite excited. I've, I've just ridden a little bit down the street and back, and now I'm going to do a few more rides before we go and just test it out properly. And all of this is for Antarctica, breaking the cycle South Pole. So just a little bit about that. The, old, the whole idea would be to cycle from uh, Leverett Glacier, which is on the Ross Ice Shelf, up to the South Pole, and then down to Hercules Inlet. So that's a distance of about 1,800 kilometres or so, and it should take maybe about six weeks. And so this is, should be a great test for what we're doing now in, in the Yukon. And um, all of this, I've, I've created not just this education program, I've created an education program with also in Australia with the, the um, Victorian uh, Education Department and I'll let you know a little bit more about that. And we're going to be raising funds for um, supporting access to education uh, in Kenya and South Africa as well through a, a brilliant organisation called YGAP. Um, so that's another great motivation for me to be able to do this stuff. And this is just how I like to finish my talks. So if you are dedicated, realistic, enthusiastic towards your goals, show a positive attitude, then you will achieve your mission. And so I think that's something you can, you can apply that to just about anything that you do. So it doesn't have to be cycling across Yukon or cycling across Antarctica. It can be whatever you would like it to be. If you use those principles and really get this vision, have to be very dedicated towards what you want to do, then it is all possible. So that, that's my message there. Now, the opportunity for, for you um, while I go through the Yukon is that you can follow um, me doing this because I'm going to be, I've got a special blog and that's the link there. So it's kateleeming.global2.vic.edu.au and I think that um, um, you'll be able to get that link later. And if you lose it, you can go to my website and just in the top right hand corner, you can click on and you can subscribe to that link. So you'll be able to follow all the blogs. There's actually some activities there that you can do as well and some information about the area. So that's essentially my talk. Um, and so what we'd like people to do with that, while well, I just flick back and while you're thinking about all your questions, um, you know, there must be a lot of questions there, but what it would be great if you can, you know, follow this and, and what I'd love students to be able to do is to be able to create their own activities. So, um, yeah, that would be the best thing. We'll, we'll inspire them to do that. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. So we'll head to a question and answer period, as you said, hopefully lots of questions. Uh, we'll start with Mrs. Huddy's class. If you guys have a question, uh, come up and go right ahead. Hi. Is that... Oh, I, I, I can't hear the question. Um, nope, they're just coming now. Okay. How much is 
So, Mrs. Honey's class, we actually, like, I couldn't hear that either. Maybe try one more time. Worst case scenario, you can type your question. In the top left, there's a little blue box, and you can chat there and then ask your question through that, and I'll ask Kate directly, okay? Is it how much food do you have to pack for your journey? Is that the question? Yes or no? Yes. How much food do you have to pack, Kate? Oh, that's a, good, that's a very good question because obviously I have to eat a lot because I'm working so hard and it's very, very cold, so you use up more energy. So, you know, I um, this time in Yukon, uh, Bob, my guide, is, is, is packing. He's, they've been cooking up all sorts of things, but I have to eat, eat about 6,000 calories a day. So that's like big breakfast with lots of um, – high energy sort of um, porridge and um, powders, could be eggs, could be lots of things. And then, then um, I'm eating all through the day, nuts and uh, chocolate and just as many calories that I can pack in because it's really important to keep eating all through the day. And it's important to get some protein um, as well to help you recover. And you have to drink a lot. So uh, drinking with a little bit of hydration, like some hydrolyte, um, fluids as well helps keep the energy going and, and because you actually lose a lot of moisture so um, uh, it's, pos it's really important to drink as well as eat so a lot of food really <laughs> good question uh, alright yeah. we'll go to Mrs. Cochran's class um, where do you sleep when you're traveling oh, good question too um, so we have tents so um, in, certainly in all the, all the Arctic areas, we, we just we have tents that are very very good tents, so they keep the weather out. And then we have very warm sleeping bags. We have mats underneath and down mats underneath. And then we have a, when we turn the stove on to start cooking, that keeps us pretty warm as well. So we sleep in these tents. Um, yeah, simple as that. So it takes a lot more energy. It's not just cycling. You've got to stop and you've got to pitch the tent and uh, and get in there pretty quickly to stay nice and warm. Excellent. All right, we'll go to Mrs. Lynch's class. Hi, guys. I don't think we can hear you right now, so try turning up your mic, or I've demuted you. I don't know. Sorry right now. Try and figure it out. You know what? I'll go to the next class, and then worst case, again, you guys can use the chat function and just write out your question there. Uh, for now, I'll head on to uh, our fourth class that joined in. We have uh, Mrs. Lynch's class. class. Yes. Go right ahead. Yep. Uh, how, how many people travel with you? That's a good question, because I didn't mention my team too much. Um, so... Uh, for example, on this journey, um, there's going to be my guide, Bob, and then um, next week, my filmmaker, Claudio, is coming, but he couldn't come straight away. He couldn't come this week. So he's coming next week, and so he's going to join us up when we start to go off the track. So that'll be Claudio, and then we'll have also Bob's wife, Teresa, who's also an adventurer. So there'll be four of us in total uh, this time, and probably the same in Antarctica, different groups, but... The filmmaker will be the same, and yeah, so it's me and three others. Excellent. All right, so this is the class. Whoa, whoa. whoa that's, a, that's two computers in one room. Two computers in one room. So, sorry, guys, I'm going to mute you again just really quickly, but that's caused a little bit of, oh, there we go. Can go you ahead. hear us? Yep. Yeah. Do you think it will be hard to sleep in Antarctica? Hard to sleep? Uh, well, I don't think so because I'm going to be working really hard. It's a good question because obviously there's 24 hours of daylight there. You don't have any darkness. But you can always just put some um, a mask over your face if you really couldn't, if the light was a problem. Uh, and again, hopefully once we get in the sleeping bags, it'll be nice and warm. So... Given that I'll be, you know, cycling for maybe eight hours a day or ten hours a day in the cold, I don't think I'll have any problems sleeping. Might have problems waking up. 
don't want to face the day. Oh no. <laughs> All right. Don't want to get <laughs> <laughs> we'll go back to Mrs. Huddy's class. If you guys have another question. Uh, okay. Didn't get that. Yep. How much every day? Well, um, I guess in this Yukon journey, because I'm not as fit as I will be when I start Antarctica, I'll probably be doing about six hours um, of cycling or so, and then we'll probably get it up to eight hours. If I, if I do more than – that's what I can continually doing. If I get do more than that, say if I do 10 or 12 hours every day, then I get too tired and then I, I – I might be able to do that for a few days, but if I'm going for a whole week or, sorry, a whole month, then you've got to be able to pace yourself a little bit more. So we'll feel that way, but I'm aiming for eight hours generally. Oh. So that's quite a lot. I think all that time that you're, how long are you at school for each day? I'm not sure. Six hours or eight hours? Imagine that. I was just recycling all of that time. <laughs> In Antarctica too, not just on a flat road. Yeah. No, right. <laughs> yeah. well, it's probably right. three times as hard to cycle on, on snow, three or four times as hard. Well, more good good for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, go to Mrs. Cochran's class. Um, have you ever been in a dangerous situation, like a bear or something? Um, I haven't come across any bears yet, touch wood. <laughs> I might do up here, so... Um, as far as animals, um, in Australia and Africa, there were snakes. We had to, like, it's a bit scary when you're riding along and there's snakes on the road. You've got to be careful. We've got to watch out for things like that. Um, what else have we had? Uh, there weren't, I, in Africa, I visited some game parks, but there I wasn't allowed to cycle because you know there's lions and things there. So actually, we were, it, we were staying safe. And you always, it's always really important to, to listen to the local people and make sure that, that you uh, stay away. In Australia, there were crocodiles as well, and in Africa, but Australia particularly at the north, there were crocodiles we had to be careful of. And make sure, you, again, make sure you get local knowledge so you don't get into trouble too much. Um, so as far as animals, yeah, no attacks yet. I'm very careful when I'm sleepy, sleeping in the tent not in Antarctica, but, but other places that you put all everything inside the tent and you zip it up so you can't get any unwanted animals in your tent at night just coming in to cuddle up and keep warm. That's, I guess, the one main benefit of Antarctica is that the only thing that might cuddle is penguins, which That's is right. okay, yeah. Uh, all right, we'll go back to Mrs. Landers. Um, Hello. How cold was it? Did you get cold? Did you get cold? Uh, yes, I got cold. And I guess uh, one of the most difficult things when I'm doing in Antarctica, in, in these polar regions, is to, to work out what to wear because I'm being very active and when I start cycling, I, I still get quite hot, so I perspire. But if you perspire, then um, that freezes, the sweat freezes. So that's the real problem because then you get very cold. So one of the big things that I'm trialing now is lots of different types of clothes. So I have lots of layers, so it hopefully wicks the per perspiration away and keeps the wind off from the outside. And I can't expose any skin, so I've got to keep all my face protected and my hands and feet. I've got all sorts of different things to try. So that's part of the, the test here. So I haven't quite got that right yet. All right. And then last but not least, we'll go back to Mrs. Lynch's class. Um, did you ever fall in the water in Iceland? In Iceland? Uh, Greenland, you mean? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, we did go to Iceland on the way to Greenland, but I didn't do any so. No. <laughs> no, we didn't fall in the water. Um, so far, I've avoided water, which is good, because it would be very, very cold. Um, no, especially with, that's why I travel with guides so we don't get into trouble and go too close to the edge of the sea where it's melting like that. But that finish, you saw that picture at the finish of Cap, at Cap Tobin and you saw all the, all the melted, um, all the little icebergs out to sea there. That was 
amazing and I, I cycled very close to the edge but I was I knew things were melting so I didn't go so far that I was I just saw where there was someone had been once before so I didn't go past that and uh, yeah that was just an amazing day that one excellent well that brings us to the end of our questions guys uh, Kate thank you so so much for the presentation uh, what we'll do now is I'm going to turn it over and demute all the classrooms microphones so they can say a big thank you all together so, Mrs. Huddy, Landrum, and Lindsay Clark. Mrs. Huddy, Landrum, and Lindsay Clark. Thank you, Kate. One, two, three. Thank you. All right. So for all the classes, those are great questions. Kate, we wish you the best of luck on your journey, and we look forward to touching base with you when you're done it as well. Uh, and thank you so much for being with us here today. Fantastic. And make sure you follow it along.